Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome yet again to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Very excited to have you with us today with this special presentation. Um, as usual, just want to remind you, uh, we have a chat box uh, to the right. If you could sign up uh, as we get started here so that we can see uh, everyone participating in the, today's discussion. And uh, before I introduce our speaker and we get started, I uh, would like, of course, to open up in a word of prayer. So bow your head with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity um, just to uh, learn about uh, uh, ultrasound um, in this, um, uh, Lord, just this uh, Christian platform. We thank you for Samaritan's Purse as an organization as it reaches out to the world uh, for the sake of Christ. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm very excited to uh, for this uh, opportunity today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce to you uh, my classmate from medical school, uh, Dr. Mark Peel. Uh, Mark uh, is a pediatric intensivist at Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, North Carolina and founder and chief medical officer of uh, an organization called 410 Medical Innovation, a company focused on improving resuscitation in shock, sepsis, and trauma. So they're doing really cutting edge work. Mark served as medical director at Wake Med Children's Hospital and director of pediatrics at Wake Med Physician Practices from 2009 to 2015. Uh, Mark also serves as medical advisor for Wake Med uh, Mobile Pediatric Critical Care Transport Team. And he also uh, uh, teaches frequently in pre-hospital management of critically ill children. Mark has faculty appointments uh, in the departments of pediatrics uh, at our alma mater, University of North Carolina, as well as Duke University. Uh, Mark received his BA from Davidson University, his MD and his MPH uh, from UNC Chapel Hill. He has been trained both in pediatrics and internal medicine um, and pediatric critical care at UNC Chapel Hill. Today, Mark is gonna be talking to us about bedside ultrasound and pediatric emergency care, shock and pneumonia. I'm a, especially uh, excited about this presentation. Uh, ultrasound, as you probably know, is the modality of the future. And so I think it has great application for all of us, both domestically and internationally. So Mark, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thanks and thanks everyone for taking time to listen. Um, I'll go ahead and just start walking through our slides. If you have questions in the audience as we go, please feel free to type them in and we'll try to get to them at the end. So, um, I am, as Lance mentioned, if we go to the next slide, uh, I practice at a hospital called Wake Med. If you go to the next slide, which I often make clear to folks outside North Carolina, is not the same as Wake Forest. So Wake Med's there at the red dot. Uh, I do happen to be faculty at both Duke and UNC, but Wake Forest is over in Winston-Salem. And the history of those names is an interesting one, but I won't go into the to why we're called Wake Med and Wake Forest is in another town. But um, uh, I led our children's hospital there at Wake Med that we built about 10 years ago for many years until I started uh, my company, but I still practice uh, half time at Wake Med in critical care. Next slide, I also helped lead this, as Lance mentioned, um, our mobile critical care team for pediatrics. And I have become uh, a big fan of ultrasound, pre hospital ultrasound. So, one quick disclaimer I'm not a fellowship trained ultrasound provider. I just I picked it up and saw some of the benefits early in my career and began to learn over time just by direct application and practice and reading how do we use ultrasound to extend our senses into the body. I became convinced years ago that this was a, a better way to go and it was a tool that should not just be in the hands of cardiologists and radiologists, but should be in the hands of almost every provider, whether it's a doc, nurse, a paramedic in the field that we can extend our senses and provide better diagnostic uh, capability and, and manage patients better through it. So um, I'm just trained on my own and I end up teaching a lot of ultrasound to our residents and to emergency medicine providers. And so I um, hope what I can share with you here will be beneficial. I know a lot of you are in a variety of practice settings, both here in the States and overseas. The cases I'm gonna share are obviously US hospital focused cases, but we'll have a lot of application for whatever practice setting you're in. Let's go to the first case. Um, and I'll, I'll present two kind of teasers at the beginning and then we'll resolve them at the end. This is a girl that came in, 10 year old with abdominal pain and fatigue. She came into our ED looking ill. Um, 
um, had mottled gray, diaphoretic appearance, was anxious, having trouble breathing, heart rate was 150, there were multiple PVCs on the EKG, and um, she was hypotensive. Next. Um, and so the question is, how do we treat that hypotension in this patient? And could this be heart failure from myocarditis? And um, so the ER folks ordered an echo, and you can see the exact language in the EPIC noted here at the bottom. Called CV testing, spoke to Rick, made aware that this patient has an emergent stat echo, not just stat, but emergent stat. And um, they're calling the echo tech in, and they should be here in about 45 minutes. So what do we know? It's going to take, you can go back to the previous one. It's going to take uh, 45 minutes for Rick to get there, set up the machine, look at the heart, send the images to the cardiologist and make a decision in maybe an hour, hour and 15 minutes on whether this patient has heart failure. We don't have that long to wait in this case. Each of us encountering a patient like this needs to know immediately what's going on. And we have the capability with bedside ultrasound to do that. Now you can go to the next one. Um, 11 year old child comes in with fever of 106, impressive fever, cough and left flank pain. White counts 20. Uh, ER physician says this has got to be pneumonia or, or pilo. Um, but the UA is negative and the x-ray is negative. Also renal ultrasound, interestingly, is negative. Um, her heart rate's in the 140s. She's a little hypotensive, 78 over 40. She gets three fluid boluses each over one hour, which uh, in retrospect is too slow to give a hypotensive child fluid boluses, but that's what happened. Um, BP did resolve to the 90s, heart rate's in the 130s. She got some ceftriaxone. No one's exactly sure what's wrong with her and she's admitted to the ward. Um, here's her x-ray, uh, clear lung fields, at least it's read that way by the radiologist. And she gets to the ward, next slide, she gets to the ward and is found to be minimally responsive by the admitting nurse, blood pressure is 80, heart rate's 160s, she has poor cap refill, and her stats are 85. Um, I happened to be the ICU doc on that day, ran down to the room found that she had diminished breast sounds on her left. Um, next slide. And um, was thinking, what do we do? Could she have pulmonary edema from all that fluid? As hypotension, if so. And what ultrasound hypotension? So we're going to just leave it there for the moment and uh, go on and talk about ultrasound. And we'll come back and, and discuss these cases a little bit later. So. I'm gonna basically focus on two areas of ultrasound, looking at the heart and lung in children. A lot of these uh, things I'll talk about are equally as applicable in adults. It happens to be that children, children is my expertise, but I would say that the applicability is broader. Um, and in particular, how do we use bedside ultrasound to assess intravascular volume? And you can go to the next slide. Um, and heart function on the one hand, and then for lung ultrasound, can we assess whether either of these patients has pneumonia, their lungs Now, one problem I find with teaching ultrasound and learning it is there's so many terms out there that ultimately it just becomes overwhelming and confusing. So I find that it's not as useful to talk about all these terms and instead just focus on the concept of bedside ultrasound for a given um, organ systems. So let's think about uh, the management of shock as recommended by PALS and the American College of Critical Care Medicine. What is recommended? We recognize shock early, we provide IV access, and we start oxygen, and then we, and we begin giving 20 per kilo boluses of fluid um, up to about 60 at least in patients with shock. And note what it says here. Assess carefully after each bolus, which is right. Repeat boluses as necessary to treat shock. And stop fluid administration if you sense rouse, respiratory distress, or hepatomegaly. Okay? These are the tools that were advised by the major organizations to use to assess for volume overload. And, and, and think back to the case I presented you. But these are hundreds of year old tools. This stethoscope was invented a little over 200 years ago. And abdominal palpation surely is a technique that we've used for hundreds of years before that. So this is what we're, a lot, we're relying on to uh, understand whether a patient is in shock or has volume overload. It turns out 
that there's some guys that had figured out a better technique um, almost hundreds of years earlier in the 1500s. These guys had already understood that ultrasound was the thing. You can go to the next slide. And so how do we do that? And I'm going to start by looking at uh, abdominal and heart ultrasound, and then we'll move into lung next. So it turns out that the IVC is actually a really impressive marker of preload uh, or, or an estimator of CVP. And that we can use it to decide, is this, could this patient in shock benefit from fluid? And so it's generally true that if you place a phased array probe in the sub xiphoid area and image the IVC as it passes through the liver just before the right atrium, that with greater than 50% collapse of the IVC on inspiration, that patient is probably volume dependent. They probably can benefit if they're in shock from a volume bolus. And on the other hand, that IVC dilation with minimal respiratory variation can indicate a lot of problems, in which case you might not want to give too much fluid. And those in include heart failure, uh, tamponade, which may benefit from a fluid bolus, at least in the short term, and other things like pulmonary embolism and pulmonary hypertension. So I'm gonna go through with you a couple of videos, and I hope these videos will come through um, to folks watching remotely. This is an IVC view of a healthy adult male. It's actually me. Um, and what you see on the left of the screen is the right atrium. Above is the liver. And the large black structure um, on the right is the inferior vena cava. And it collapses a little bit with inspiration. Now, next slide. What I do to, to, to show you this experiment is I go out and run about 8 to 10 miles on a hot day, including all the stadium steps at. Um, Keenan Stadium in, in Chapel Hill, and lose two and a half liters of water by weight. And what you see after I run these two uh, sub xiphoid uh, IVC views is that on inspiration, I have almost complete IVC collapse. I've become volume depleted. And that's what a patient in shock who is volume dependent may look like. Now, next slide. I go back over to the hospital and I ask one of my nurses to give me a liter of fluid rapidly. And within about five minutes, after a liter is given, you can see that the IVC has now become much more visible and with less collapse, probably less than 50% if you measure it at the right spot, um, less collapsible. So we can actually look for volume depletion and look for resolution of it simul you know, almost simultaneously with bedside ultrasound. It's pretty cool. Next slide is the image of a child with actual septic. It's an actual child with septic shock. We diagnosed uh, volume depletion on the left and said this child needs volume. After 60 per kilo, you can see that the IVC and actually the intrahepatic vein, uh, the hepatic vein are more distended. And, we've, and at that point, we also noted clinically that the child's heart rates come down, the cap refills better, the mental status is better. One quick aside, why is, go back to the previous one if you would, why is hepatomegaly recommended um, uh, for children as an assessor of volume overload. The, the liver capsule in children is distendable. And so the liver acts as your capacitance vessel. So when there's excess vascular, intravascular volume, and we develop children, it's much less common in adults who instead get JVD and other signs of volume overload. But all I'm showing on the right is that the hepatic vein becomes visible, whereas it was invisible on the left uh, side of the screen. So a sign of um, adequate rehydration and in some cases over uh, hydration is a visible non-collapsible hepatic vein. You can go to the next one. This in contrast is a patient with heart failure and what do we notice here? There are actually two patients. We notice that the IVC is large and, and the actual diameter of it doesn't really matter. There, there's tons of literature on what diameter is important and how does it compare to the aortic diameter. I never look at that. I just subjectively look and say is it collapsing or is it not? In both of these cases, the IVC is dilated and there's zero variation. This is the patient where you could think, ha, huh, maybe I am encountering heart failure and I should go on and look up at the heart, which I'm going to teach you to do next. Um, one quick aside, some uh, new ultrasound machines are actually automatically measuring this for you. So it'll interestingly uh, find 
the uh, point within the IVC at which to measure, and it will measure collapsibility. And you see that the collapsibility index here is noted by the ultrasound machine to be 58%. So it's collapsing a lot. Kind of a cool feature, not necessarily um, available on all machines and not even necessary, but it's, it can be a helpful feature. So next, we see that the IVC is either dilated or collapsed, and then we want to go and look at what the heart's doing. And there are two views which um, a non-cardiologist can best use to assess this. One is called the peristernal long, in which the probe, the, the phased array probe, is placed at about the fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum. And the dot, or the indicator, is facing the left hip. And there you see on the left image, mostly the left ventricle with adequate contractility, the, uh, and the mitral valve, which is on every uh, episode of diastole coming up and hitting the septum. That's a good marker of adequate LV function. The, the mitral snaps wide open, blood rushes in, and then we have nice contractility of the ventricle, which is then ejected out of the aortic root, which you can see above the mitral valve. Um, next image shows you um, just a corresponding anatomy of the heart, which you're looking at on ultrasound, and this often becomes confusing when people are starting out even figuring out what they're looking at. Um, and one way to overcome this instead of using the peristole long is actually to use the sub xiphoid view on the next slide. This is me again, not me on the right, but me, uh, my, my heart image on the left side. And a simple um, um, dropping of the angle of the phase array probe and aiming it up towards the heart just below the rib cage will show you a nice almost four chamber view of the heart. It's a great way to move from the IVC view to the cardiac view and get a good overall feeling for contractility, RV size, and whether or not there's a pericardial effusion. Next slide shows you the anatomy there. And the next slide um, will show you actually the view that you get if you flip the probe um, to the other to the opposite direction. So that, that ends up being more anatomically correct to look at the probe to look at the uh, apex of the heart over to the right. Um, and the advantage of this view also is that you get a better feel for the right ventricle, which is more difficult to see in the peristernal long view. So I tend to favor this. I look at the IVC first, get an overall feel for the volume status of the patient, and then I simply drop the angle and take a quick look at the heart to confirm my suspicion of whether we have hyperdynamic function or potentially in small, in rare cases, heart failure. So let me show you a couple of actual peristernal long views of various disease states. This is a hyperdynamic uh, function. It, it looks like on the, on the web view here that we're getting a, a slower frame rate. So these hearts are actually beating faster in reality than you're probably seeing on the screen. But what you can appreciate is that the left ventricular and uh, free wall and septum are almost completely coming together. These patients have ejection fractions of probably over 90%. These are dehydrated septic shock children. And you notice that the ventricle is beating, beating away and there's very little LV volume left at the end of systole. In contrast, in the next slide is heart failure, where we see minimal movement of the LV uh, free wall or septum, very vague opening of the mitral valve, and little ejection of the uh, volume of the LV. So these are the two extremes. And I think they're the main extremes that you need to begin to appreciate. And it takes, a, it takes some time to, to repeat this over and over with a variety of patients and get used to what's normal. But uh, these are not ultimately super hard um, diagnoses to make for us non-cardiologists. So speaking of that, what's the evidence that any of us who are not cardiologists in the next slide can actually do this? And the truth is, if you want to review this article that I have uh, pulled um, from just a couple of years ago. It's a great overall summary of the use of point of care ultrasound in pediatrics. A number of studies actually document that with limited training, with focused training, even by short videos that people watch, that emergency medicine physicians in particular, and I believe this applies to other specialties, can accurately assess IV status, basic um, subjective LV function, um, including uh, diagnosing potential myocarditis and heart failure. Uh, tamponade, which I've not shown a lot of images of here today, but um, it's worth uh, learning about if you get interested in this topic.
And interestingly, during CPR, which hopefully we're not all performing a ton, but when we are, is that heart beating. Pulse checks in CPR, especially in children, are notoriously uh, poor indicators of whether there's recovery of heart function. And if we, um, at my hospital in the trauma room, are resuscitating a child, what we'll do is pop the ultrasound probe on and the sub view um, after our CPR, epi, and uh, defibrillation if necessary, and see if we see cardiac activity. And um, there are some indications that the presence of activity, even though we can't feel a, pul feel a pulse, makes a greater risk of survivability and we'll, we'll continue with our resuscitative efforts. So a technique worth learning. All right, what about uh, ultrasound for shock in particular? Fascinating study that I've presented here on the right um, from last year, actually two years ago, um, where they looked at ultrasound guided versus standard management in pediatric septic shock. And as an assessment of intravascular volume, they used the IVC collapsibility. And the, what they did was they had folks look subjectively at the ejection fraction. They didn't have them rate the number. They just said, is the LV function high, normal, low? And is the IVC greater than 50% collapsed? And if it was, they would continue to give fluid boluses. And they compared this to standard care. And they showed that when folks resuscitated by IVC collapsibility, and they kept giving fluid until the IVC was uh, greater than, uh, was less than 50% collapsed, they resulted in, shock, in shorter time to reversal of shock. They gave more fluid in the first hour, but paradoxically less in the first in the next 24 hours or in the entire length of stay. They had they halved, cut in half the PICU length of stay, eight versus 14 days, and they showed lower mortality in the severe septic shock group. All an indication that a better bedside tool can help us assess: Does this patient need volume? And should I give more? So really exciting. It's a really exciting study. And interestingly, I'm currently with some other investigators writing a protocol to try to replicate this. This was done in Egypt. We're going to hopefully replicate it here in the U.S. All right, let's move to lungs. So this becomes a little uh, more of a gray zone. Uh, people are not as used to thinking that ultrasound has any utility in the evaluation of pneumonia. And it turns out it actually may be better than x-ray. And for particularly for those of you who are practicing in limited resource settings, what an incredible tool to help you if you don't have access, immediate access to x-ray. Also, interestingly, just for primary care here in the States or for our EMS providers who don't have access to x-ray, can, can ultrasound help us assess what's going on in those lungs? And the answer is yes. So um, great study in chest published a few years ago in children documenting that uh, uh, ultrasound focused training for emergency medicine providers can actually be as good as or better than chest x-ray for the diagnosis of pediatric pneumonia. It's probably better uh, than x-ray for diagnosing pneumothorax. It's an excellent and probably better technique for diagnosing pleural effusion. And there's increasing data in kids, in particular this study which showed in one trial up in New York that they had a 40% reduction in the use of chest x-ray when they implicated a focused, when they, when they implemented a focused uh, pediatric lung ultrasound protocol. They had no cases of missed pneumonia. Novice users and expert users, users were similar in their ability to diagnose pneumonia. And uh, importantly for the US uh, world, they decreased their ED length of stay by 30 minutes by avoiding a good number of x-rays. So it actually had a cost benefit. Um, pretty impressive. And one, one benefit I find often with uh, particularly lung ultrasound is that parents get to participate with you in the diagnosis. If we're sending a child off for x-ray or we're listening with a stethoscope, it's kind of the doctor doing their thing, making their diagnosis and assimilating information that the parent can't participate in. Whereas when we have an ultrasound probe on the child, they're looking with us they, and we can show them here is a normal lung, here's fluid, here's pneumonia. And they, and they actually end up, and ends up being a relationship builder in my, in my experience with, with parents. Um, okay, so how do you go about lung ultrasound? Let's go to the next slide. Well, it can be super confusing, and here's a couple of adult uh, references that show you all the different zones you're supposed to look at um, to uh, make sure you don't miss a pneumonia. And in one, in the, in the image on the right, there's 13 zones, and that's just on one side of the chest. How is ever, anyone ever going to do this well? Okay, it just becomes overwhelming. So I say, if you go to the next slide, that's just simply too complicated. I'm going to show you a simpler way to do it. So. For lung ultrasound, in contrast to heart, you're going to want a linear probe. Or 
um, in larger patients, the curvilinear probe will work. A linear probe actually works best, however. Indicator is gonna go to, uh, toward the, the head, and I start in the nipple line and the mid-axillary line. That ends up being a great spot to begin locating pneumonia in a child. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, an actual patient I'm scanning. And the next slide will show you the, the really the two zones I look at on the front. Go to the next slide. And what's real, what's what's really interesting is that in children, the the lung, the diaphragm really comes up to the nipple line. There's a very small, there's actually, a, you think it comes down to the base of the ribs and the tip of the lingula might come a little bit further down, but there's not a lot of lung field to scan there. So I've shown you one and two zones here on both slides. And if you scan in both of those, and it, no, you know, that's fine. If you scan in these zones, so mid axillary line from the lower axilla, the anterior axillary line from the nipple up to the clavicle, and then in the back, just medial to the scapula up and down, you can really cover all the lung fields in about a minute very nicely. Um, and all children, as you know, are, are probably as cooperative as this little girl is being. Um, and that was a joke, actually, but if you'll go to the next slide, one thing to help them become cooperative is use warm gel. And so um, kids don't like cold gel stuck on their chests, and so I try to always get a warm gel. And if, if I don't have access to that warmer, I'll just take a pack of uh, something like Surgilube and warm it up in my pocket before, before scanning. It's a lot better. Okay, so what do we find when we look? Here's the basics. A lines are normal, and you may need to advance one more to get these movies to go. Yeah, there you go. So, what are we looking at here? So, we're looking at um, with a linear probe in the anterior axillary line in a child, and what we see, you can go back to the A lines one. What we see is the bright white line is the pleural interface. That's the interface between the visceral and parietal pleura. That shows up as bright white, and we see that it's moving. Um, ultrasound doesn't like air, so it doesn't know what to do with air, and lungs are mostly air. So what we see is what's called A lines, repetitive, regularly spaced bright white lines um, kind of going off into the distance. And we're not actually seeing lung there, we're seeing air. And what's happening is the probe is sensing uh, the density of the pleura, and it's appropriately placing a white line there. Part of those ultrasound beams are bouncing off that pleura, hitting the probe and bouncing down again, only to come back to the probe and be read again. The machine interprets that as another line spaced an identical distance below the first. And this happens over and over and produces what are called A lines or air lines. It's essentially an artifact. Interestingly, uh, peritone uh, peritoneal free air will look the same way. Any, any, anytime you have a, a, a space with air in it, pneumothorax will look the same way. And I'll show you what a pneumothorax looks like in a minute. It's not a black space, just absence of movement of that plural line. So let's the next go to B lines. B lines are the white lines, which almost look like spotlights shining down into the lung, which indicate the presence of fluid within the lung parenchyma, okay? This is where we begin to diagnose pulmonary edema and pneumonia. The next slide shows you another uh, way of viewing a, a B lines. On the left, we see an individual. Uh, you may have to click the advance one more time to get it to move. There you go. Um, the, the B lines may be individual lines, which shine off into the distance, or confluent B lines is on the right, where the lung is completely socked in and dense, and we have a significant um, lobar pneumonia. Next slide, we'll show you another view of B lines. Oh, there you go. Okay, yeah, so B lines may be one or two, or they may be almost confluent. On the left, we have a case of pulmonary edema, on the right, a case of pneumonia. And I'll show you how to distinguish those in a second. Next slide, we'll show you a, a scheme of rating the various B lines, and this is more for a pulmonary edema. Um, it's said that more than three B lines per lung field indicate pulmonary edema, and if you see B lines only in one spot of the lung, that's probably not global edema. If they're everywhere, it is. And mostly in kids, we're seeing pneumonia as, as focal B lines, and I'll show you a number of examples of those in a minute. So what about pneumothorax? So pneumothorax is not a big black space. It's just absence of lung sliding. So 
On the left, you see the pleural line is sliding and there are little tiny um, dots that slide along. Some people call these marching ants or lung, um, I've heard them called lung rockets, a variety of things. But you can see the little bit of movement in that pleura. And that's probably just the, the pleural fluid, an artifact of the pleural fluid moving back and forth. That's very sensitive for the absence of, um, for the absence of um, pneumothorax. On the right, we see that the patient is actually trying to breathe. There's movement in the chest wall, but there is zero pleural slide. That little, that pleural line is not moving at all. That is a pneumothorax. So that lung may be one millimeter away from the chest wall. It may be two centimeters away. We have air artifacts still, but no pleural slide. That's, the, that's diagnostic for pneumothorax. Next, how about diagnosing pneumonia? What in the world are we gonna do with ultrasound and pneumonia? So here's an X-ray. Are, are you guys hearing me okay, Lance? I saw that um, sound might've been a problem. Uh, it's been intermittently slightly problem, but we're doing great right now. I'll switch over to a different uh, mic and see if that helps, okay? I wanna be sure everyone can hear me. How's that? Can you guys hear me? Sounds great. Okay. I think my batteries may have been wearing down on my headset. All right. So pneumonia. Um, X-ray. Everyone would agree that that's pneumonia. We have a right lower lobe uh, density obscuring the, the border of the diaphragm. What does that look like on ultrasound? So all the lines. And then what we also see is that the plural, that nice crisp plural line is disrupted. And I'll show you some images of that in a minute. Some people call that shred sign. So it's almost as if the pleural line is shredded up. And we see bright little white dots, which pe people think are probably air bronchograms, being kind of shimmering in the, in the ultrasound view. And sometimes we'll then see pleural fluid, which is a black stripe um, between the pleural line and the chest wall. So all these findings that you see here are consistent with uh, pneumonia. And it takes a number of patient views to get used to this, but once you see it, it's almost unmistakable. You scan the patient, you have A-lines, 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 and suddenly some big bright white thing comes into view and you've suddenly found the pneumonia. And it's actually uh, real satisfying when you're, when you're able to do it. And um, here's another image of things. Um, on the left, regular normal lung with A-lines, pain B, uh, we have little white dots that are, that are called air bronchograms. Um, C, just denser consolidation. D is, is that often what I look for, which is the interface between normal lung on the right side of pain D and con confluent B lines on the left. That's where the, that's where the pneumonia starts. Um, and then if you look, look over to pain F, you can see a pleural effusion, which ends up being a black uh, uh, space. Uh, between the pleural line and <clears throat> the chest wall. So let's look at a couple actual patients. Um, this is why it's called shred sign. It looks shredded up. So instead of a nice white crisp line um, between, uh, right at the pleural uh, interface, we have, go back to the previous one, please. We just have uh, disrupted pleura and then confluent B lines below. That's a clear evidence of a probable bacterial pneumonia. So why does this happen? What I'm going to show you next before you go to the next slide is an actual thoracoscopic image that we took during um, a thoracoscopic surgery of a child with empyema. So we're going to look at the pleural surface and you're going to see how it actually looks like this shredded up uh, pleura that we see in the ultrasound images. So go ahead and go to the next one and see if the video will play. Next one. There you go. So hard to see. What we're looking at, we're looking straight across at the chest wall. Below us is the lung, the very consolidated, irritated lung, which you can see is a cobblestoning and irritation of the pleura, which actually mirrors, I believe there's the diaphragm on the left, which actually mirrors what we see in ultrasound. So that pleura goes from being a nice, smooth, shiny surface to a very irritated, ruffled surface. And that gives us the image of the shred sign um, and confluent B lines below it um, on lung ultrasound. You can go to the next. Here's unmistakable pneumonia, confluent B lines with effusion. So if I see shred sign, disrupted pleura, and B lines, and then I have an effusion also, I'm almost always calling that bacterial pneumonia. Not much else produces that effusion. 
especially if it's focal. Okay, next slide, this is an image of acute chest syndrome in a child with sickle cell. And you can see that she's got complete dense consolidation of the entire left lung and beginning to on the right with their bronchograms, normal lung only at the top right. Next slide. And here is her right upper lobe on the, on the left side of your screen and the dense consolidation of acute chest um, on the right. Okay, we're getting through this pretty quickly. So let's go back to our cases and see how we would apply ultrasound in these cases. Um, so the 10-year-old with abdominal pain and fatigue, you're appearing on exam, model gray diaphoretic. So a kid that comes in like this with tachycardia, hypotension, and PVCs almost certainly has acute viral myocarditis. Next slide. And, and I've shown you this child's ex, uh, echo already. Almost zero heart function on the peristone long view. See how the mitral valve barely opens, and the IVC is completely dilated and not varying. This child um, had severe acute heart failure from myocarditis, and in fact, shortly after this was taken, um, had a cardiac arrest and ended up going on ECMO. So this is the child that you want to know, is this myocarditis or not, and I'm not going to flood this child with fluid uh, because I might do harm. The child might benefit from a small fluid bolus, but certainly a smaller one than we would typically give. Um, let's skip the next slide, if you would, the 1.5, and go to case two. Thank you. So our other child, 11-year-old fever, hypotension in the ED, got three liters of fluid, and then suddenly is hypoxemic and hypotensive with altered mental status on the floor. What's going on with her? We start high flow cannula, we pop an IVC probe on, and instead of the fear, which she's gotten volume overloaded in the ED, we show complete IVC collapse. That's interesting. Move the linear probe over to her left lung where I heard some um, bronchiolar breath sounds, and sure enough, she's got a consolidation left lower lobe that did not show up on x-ray. No B lines anywhere in her lungs. She does not have pulmonary edema. We push uh, 10 per kilo or 20 per kilo quickly, improve her blood pressure, crank up her high flow oxygen, start to norepinephrine, and we're able to treat her effectively. And if we had not had ultrasound, we would probably not have known, one, that she had pneumonia, two, that she was actually still volume depleted and in septic shock. This totally changed our diagnostic understanding of what was wrong with this child and altered our management. Go to the next slide. And, left, and there's her pneumonia, left lower lobe, which had not shown up on ultrasound. My point here is that um, we can probably not only get away without x-ray in some cases, we may actually make a diagnosis that's not apparent on x-ray in the first place if we become adept with ultrasound use. And if you're overseas out in the field and you don't even have an x-ray, what a reassuring uh, ability to have a tool in your hand that could let you make these diagnoses uh, much, more, much more quickly. Next case. Oh, yeah, this is the rest of our case. So heart rate comes down, blood pressure comes up. She go, becomes alert with that fluid bolus because we're now perfusing her brain. Interestingly, we repeat the x-ray, and guess what? There's the pneumonia. So before this occurred, I would have said there's no such thing as fluffing out a pneumonia with fluids. Well, I was wrong. It actually happens. That child was super dry. She had a pneumonia film. If you go back in retrospect and look at her lateral, there probably was a little retrocardiac density that the radiologist and the docs missed, but it wasn't obvious. And so once we rehydrate her, there's her pneumonia apparent on x-ray. Um, we, we, we give her a little more fluid, start her on some norepi peripherally, no central line. Um, this can all be done in very under-resourced settings if necessary. And we have her off that and oxygen in a couple of days. She went home and did beautifully. Um, okay, let's go through a couple more cases and then we'll have some time um, uh, for questions. So let's take the case of a two-year-old, uh, fever, runny nose, cough. Comes to the ED, got a high fever, tachycardic, SATs of 80, she's RSV positive, and no infiltrate on x-ray. And here's the radiologist read, perihylar infiltrates with some central atelectasis, which could be due to small airways, airways disease, possibly viral infection, no focal pneumonia. So moderately helpful read on the, from the radiologist. What do we do with this child? Is is all of her or all of her symptoms caused by that RSV positive uh, uh, diagnosis? So um, here's the X-ray, just as the radiologist read. 
And next, next, um, we listen to our lungs. Here's some wheezes. And here, we do hear focal crackles at the left. So there's still a role for a stethoscope. So I kind of joke that ultrasound is replacing my stethoscope. But there is still a role for it. Um, and um, we look back at the x-ray and say, yeah, maybe there's a pneumonia. Put on a bedside ultrasound. And here is what we find. So the shred sign, dense B lines, little white dots indicative of air bronchograms. And we think this is probably bacterial pneumonia. And we treat her with antibiotics and she improves. Um, and that was her repeat x-ray where it fluffed out a little bit more. So again, quicker to the diagnosis with ultrasound than with x-ray. Next case, number three, is a six-year-old with fever and abdominal pain. No URI symptoms, though she had had a cough. Not eating, high temp, um, sats are fine. She's a little tachypnic, a little tachycardic. She gets a three-way abdomen, just showed constipation. And so she goes for CT because she has belly pain, anorexia, and fever. Um, that's negative. Sodium is low. That's interesting. Y count's high. That's interesting. A bunch of other labs are negative. By the way, a low hyponatremia in a child with fever almost always means something is seriously, there, there's a real diagnosis there to be found, usually bacterial. That, that always gets, my, gets me thinking, um, especially that plus white count plus fever. So here's our x-ray. Negative. Red is negative. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit of the punchline. You notice that you lose that left heart border just ever so slightly. It's a key finding. We don't use the, lose the diaphragm, but you don't totally see the left heart border. Her CT, next image, was read as negative. But guess what a belly CT it does? It goes up through the base of the lung. And if you look carefully in the right-hand pane, lateral to the heart, you see a big white thing that's not supposed to be there. The radiologist did not have uh, that in mind. They were looking at the belly. And so one thing it pays is to go and look at our own films. Number two, it pays to go do our own exam. And what we found was, go to the next slide. If you look at this uh, CT image again, you see that there's something hiding right there behind the heart where it's not supposed to be. And that was pneumonia that we then went with ultrasound and found, if you go to the next slide. So left lingula is a dense pneumonia. So what you're seeing in the left-hand panel, that curved bright white line is her diaphragm. Below that is the spleen. Above that is lung. We see a little normal lung sneaking in there, but the rest of it is dense. It almost looks like the same density as spleen. That's weird. That means a dense consolidation. Sometimes the pneumonia is referred to as hepatization of the lung. It gets dense enough that it almost looks just like liver. On the right-hand side, again, we see the diaphragm curving throughout the image, some A-lines, but then also these little bright white dots, the air bronchograms, and a little bit of shred sign with B-lines which indicates pneumonia. So we diagnosed this girl with not appendicitis, but left lower limb pneumonia. Sure enough, on the repeat x-ray the next day, after she's been given fluids, you see it more impressively. That diaphragm is raised. She has atelectasis there. You lose the border of the heart, and she had a left lower lobe pneumonia. Next day, just to confirm our suspicions, guess what she's developed? An effusion. So on the left, you... Uh, B lines and shred sign in that lung, and the lung moving in and out of view with, with a nice, crisp, black portion between the chest wall and the lung. That's her uh, pleural effusion. And we see the same thing there on the right. If you'll count the dots down, the first, second dot is right in the middle of that black effusion. And that's almost diagnostic of, in the setting of fever and B lines and shred sign, it's almost diagnostic of a bacterial pneumonia. So we'll be able to treat her and uh, treat her in the right way. Next case, 14-year-old, uh, uh, fever, chest pain, hypoxia, and blood-tinged sputum. It's had uh, URI symptoms and a cough and a fever for a couple of weeks. In the ED is afebrile, a little tachycardic. Sats are 88. Chest x-ray shows left flow of pneumonia. CRP is 9. What's wrong with this child? And sure enough, there we find a left lower lobe pneumonia. It may not even need an x-ray for that. And on what you see on the left-hand side of your screen is actually a large pleural effusion 
with the dense lung moving in and out of view. So as the child inhales, that lung tissue comes down into the costophrenic angle and just shows up right in the middle of that pleural effusion. When they exhale, you see diaphragm below, pleural fluid above, and then the extra, and the lung comes in and out of view. And then lastly, we'll do one more quick case. This is a four-month-old with bronchiolitis um, who is in the hospital on oxygen, just getting supportive care and about to go home and what happens, but a new fever appears. So we get an x-ray and um, was read as negative on retrospective uh, review. It did show retrocardiac pneumonia, but we did an ultrasound and were able to start antibiotics appropriately. Look at the next slide. Here's this child's fever course, comes in with a fever of 104, defervesces over the period of a day or so, and then suddenly a new fever spike. What's wrong? What's up with that? Does the child have a new secondary pneumonia? X-ray next, which uh, on AP view doesn't show much other than what looks like a viral illness. On the right, you can probably see a retrocardiac density, which was, which was missed. And then on the lung ultrasound, we see a very focal left lower lobe. You can go to the next slide, uh, pneumonia. And I don't think this one has a video. Um, Actually, I'm going to show you one more, just one more uh, case. So three-year-old developmental delay, trach, um, new onset fever and seizures that are very difficult to control. And the parents are like, this never happens. These seizures are never this hard to control. What's wrong? Chest x-ray is done. It's read as negative. So we admit the child for seizure control, fever control, and further diagnostic workup. Quick lung ultrasound shows what? On the left and right upper lobe not A lines, but confluent B lines and disruption of the, of the pleura and a tiny pleural effusion. This child has developing ARDS prior to showing up on x-ray. And if you look six hours later on the next film, sure enough, um, you go to the next one. Sure enough, this child is fluffed out pneumonia everywhere. So once again, x-ray lagging the ability to diagnose uh, pneumonia on on ultrasound. And then I'll just go to the last slide, um, kind of my top 10 reasons. You're going to have to scroll through these, I'm sorry, um, to use ultrasound. It's safer for IV placement and CVLs. It's better than x-ray. It improves our evaluation in shock. Um, it's better pulse check. That It's better than a pulse check in, in detecting return of spontaneous circulation. It's certainly better at detecting and then draining pleural effusions. It's good for about 100 other things, looking at abscesses, finding fractures. It saves patients radiation. It can improve our time to diagnosis and our ED flow. And lastly, my favorite, because it's cool. That's my favorite top reason, reason to use <laughs> ultrasound. A couple of resources you guys can go to if anyone is a Mac user. There's a free ebook. And this is kind of, this is how I did my course on ultrasound, actually. It's called Introduction to Bedside Ultrasound. You can go to, to uh, Apple iBooks. I think that's what it's called, and download these books for free right on your uh, Mac. And they have a variety of text, images, and videos to lead you through basic and more complex ultrasound. Next, there are a number of um, podcasts out there that you can listen to when you're on your run or traveling. Five Minute Sono is great. My favorite is the Ultrasound Podcast. If you go back to go back to the next one, Ultrasound Podcast is. Uh, kind of my favorite. It's really funny and informative. And um, if you'll go back to 2014 and start listening through, you'll, you'll really learn a ton of good ultrasound techniques. And next, um, there's also uh, these two uh, resources, uh, Academic Life and Emergency Medicine has a good uh, lung ultrasound review and then MRAP, which you have to pay for, but is also an excellent resource. So I'm going to stop there. It's uh, almost 12.50. And um, Lance, if you want to ask any questions or, or go through some of the questions that might have come in, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Absolutely. Mark, um, incredible presentation. Um, yeah, I, I love this topic because, as you alluded to in the beginning, um, I mean, I, this is definitely the modality of the future. Um, I, do not, I have not purchased my own handheld ultrasound unit, but uh, I... Uh, anticipate doing so in the next couple of years. I mean, um, what's exciting, I, I think, is um, that I think there's incredible application both domestically and uh, internationally, especially in resource uh, limited settings, um, you know, where you don't 
you may not have even adequate x-ray, but you've got this uh, ultra uh, incredible uh, handheld ultrasound. Um, we're treat, uh, teaching our post residents uh, to use a handheld uh, ultrasound. And um, right. anyway, I just, uh, I think it's, uh, it's just uh, incredible technology and, and you gave a great presentation, made it really uh, simple. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to answer some questions here and uh, maybe uh, at the end, uh, I know you're not endorsing any products, but maybe you could talk about yeah. um, some small handheld devices uh, yep. that might be uh, worthy of consideration. So, sure. um, yeah, let me start off here. Um, starting off, uh, we've got see a couple uh, questions there. Yeah. Um, we've got Sam, he says, um, ultrasound, uh, I believe in use in pediatric tuberculosis in developing countries, we usually use uh, manto, a manto, which uh, is invasive. Um, let's see, just one second, Mark. Uh, it says, uh, I'm, let's see, I'm not sure exactly what his question is. Uh, I guess is basically, can you elaborate a little bit about the, the use uh, for pulmonary TB? Yeah. So I'm not, since I don't see a ton of pulmonary TB, I can't tell you that I'm in any way an expert on that, but there is some actually good evidence that in the setting of, particularly of HIV with, with pulmonary TB, that you can yeah. diagnose, you can beautifully uh, diagnose um, pulmonary TB by ultrasound. If you go to the ultrasound podcast yeah. uh, that, I, that I highlighted, it's called The Ultrasound Podcast. There is an episode on this very topic, which you can probably search on their site, and they interview a doc from Africa who's using ultrasound to diagnose mm -hmm. uh, uh, TB in the setting of HIV. So while I can't say I'm an expert, it was one of the podcasts I listened to and said, wow, this has got to be a technology we get in the hands of folks overseas, yeah. including myself when I go overseas, and yeah. what to use, what, what to take. There's probably no perfect solution. Um, the big machines like we have in our hospitals run from twenty to fifty thousand dollars. Not an affordable or transportable technology. Yeah. Um, the small handhelds are not perfect, but they're becoming better. And I'll tell you two, not endorsing one. There is the Philips Illumify and the Butterfly IQ. And again, on the Ultrasound Podcast, there's a, a recent January 21, 2019 review of these two technologies if you want to go watch them. Okay. Lumify, Lumify and Butterfly. The cool thing about the Butterfly is that it plugs into your iPhone. And since I'm an iPhone fan, pretty cool. And it has a, an all-in-one linear and phased array probe. Uh, one probe, one device. I believe it works with Samsung's as well. So it's actually something I don't own yet but would like to. And I'm hearing a lot of good stuff about it. Limitations are that it has a it drains battery life very quickly, and um, it is probably not as good at kind of deep imaging of belly and and through a lot of uh, obesity. If you're having to look through a lot of tissue, that's been my 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 experience. But some of the images I showed you of myself in those earlier videos came from that exact device. So awesome. I think the technology is getting better. I see a question here on any false positives and negatives, and the answer is absolutely. I can't tell you rates of those. Um, it depends on your training. I just say get better by doing it a lot, and your your rate of diagnostic accuracy will grow. And then one more, Lance. Um, I see this question. It says, to ultrasound and gel cost – oh, do ultrasound and gel cost less than x-ray equipment? And I would say, Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I don't yes. know what your what your X-ray equipment costs, but you need power. You need to install it. Yeah. And and it, the Luma the uh, Butterfly IQ is around twenty five hundred dollars, so not cheap, but also uh, much more manageable probably than big X-ray or big ultrasound equipment. Yeah, especially like if you're talking about digital X-ray, unequivocally uh, ultrasound and gel is substantially uh, less expensive. So yeah. Um, and and going back to Sam's uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not an uh, expert in ultrasound by any um, stretch of the imagination, but um, I would say with regard to pediatric TB, um, you know, and a lot has to do, you know, are they HIV positive or not? But I, Mark, I'm going to take a, uh, uh, I'm going to say here, but I, I wonder if you could see like, uh, you know, like, for example, apical infiltrates, perhaps suggestive of TB yep. or yep. a Gones complex, I'm sure will show up. Or in the yep. case of miliary TB, I, I imagine that will 
um, show up uh, the mill the mill area and filtrates will show up nicely on uh, ultrasound too. Um, and then in the context pediatric TB, they almost always have scrofula. They have you know on exam they have uh, diffuse uh, lymphadenopathy or you know like cervical lymphadenopathy. And uh, so I think uh, I, I would imagine there's um, you know that uh, it would be a great uh, diagnostic tool for for uh, pulmonary TB. I did. That's great, Lance, and I I will. Um um point you to the ultrasound podcast episode from uh 2015 on this very topic really sure. fascinating there's actually two uh episodes it's out of south africa and they'll teach they'll walk you through with in images and technique how to diagnose tb and again you're much more of an expert but it's worth and learning more about yeah. uh, um some podcast and type in TB in the search window, you'll find it. Great. All right. Fantastic. Um, Mark, I think uh, today we had about uh, 25 people um, from uh, all over the United States, uh, also India, South Korea, and Kenya. Right. Um, so uh, we really thank you so much for um, sharing this uh, incredible information with us. Again, uh, I definitely will. I think in, in five years, we're going to see um, ultrasound units in the hands of so many healthcare providers, Absolutely. not even not even just physicians, but, you know, uh, nursing staff and uh, other ancillary uh, staff. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So uh, and you you made it really simple and easy to follow. So thank you so much. Yeah. Happy um, to do it. Privilege. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to see you, Mark. Um, just a few reminders to our listening audience. Um, CME credit is available for this session. Uh, the form and instructions will be available in your email. And uh, we will be sending a follow-up email with the link to this recording um, in the next uh, day or so. Uh, remember, you can join the uh, forum uh, at health.samaritanspurse.org. Um, please go to that site. We have an archives of hundreds of incredible presentations with CME available. Um, also, I just really encourage you uh, to uh, uh, tell your friends about the forum and uh, get the word out because uh, there's great information available to you that you can utilize in your practice. Again, both stateside and internationally. I uh, want to remind everybody our next forum will be on Wednesday, April the 10th. Dr. Bruce Steffies uh, will be uh, presenting Mistakes in OR Design, uh, which will be a fantastic presentation. Bruce does a phenomenal job. And with that, I thank you for joining us and uh, have a great day. God bless. Thanks. Bye.